type of argument. And that's a very different argument than what had existed prior to that. In 1982, the convention took time to negotiate, da 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 And you really have the trade-off. The trade-off that the US and the Russians were kind of, in, you know, we're, we're kind of working together, which is interesting. <clears throat> Now, uh, working together to try and get this trade-off, this big trade-off between the high seas freedom issues, really navigation, but not just navigation, and the concerns of coastal states. Coastal state concerns that were being announced, pronounced, developed by the uh, largely, a large part of the 200 mile zone, of course, came out of Africa, uh, support in Latin America, support in large parts of the world including Canada for some things. We were, Canada was very much on the, you know, in support of the 200 nautical mile fishing zone, for example. This is a chance to remove the Russians. And keep them around. Because, you know, we always want to have some Russians around. Just kind of maybe move them over so they're not coming in and drinking all your alcohol. And just you push them over the way a little bit. That, and that was okay. That was okay. And we let them in and want, you know, to, to, to fish every once in a while if they paid us a bit of money and they said some nice things. And, and that's sort of what happened with the Russians. But the idea, at least, was that uh, there was this kind of bargain that was going to have to be set up in 1982 in one form or another. It was going to be created. And what you do have, then, is two things about the high seas that are important. Many things are important about the high seas. But some things, two things I think that, that I, you know, we have an area that is referred to as the high seas. And we know where that is now. Right? That is a geographically defined area. Where's Clive when you need it so we can tell you where it is on a map? And with mercators and the lines and all that stuff. But you know, it's beyond the 200 nautical miles zone. But that's what we call the high seas now. And so in the high seas, there are certain rights, there are certain opportunities, and, and that's an area beyond 200 nautical miles. So geographically, there is a high seas regime that you know to apply um, in that area. But of course, it doesn't apply to the mineral resources. The mineral resources of the ocean floor, beyond areas of national jurisdiction, are subject to the common heritage of humankind, subject to the international seabed authority, all that kind of stuff that you already know. In one form or another. And of course, <clears throat> the high seas doesn't apply to the continental shelf. Goes your legal continental shelf or your physical continental shelf goes beyond 200 nautical miles. In which case, then you as a coastal state, and I know you've had lots of lectures on this. Um, if you happen to be a country that doesn't have a continental shelf, you're thinking to yourself, why did I listen to all of that? But that's okay. You now know what the other countries are doing. Uh, so continental shelf areas that are beyond 200 nautical miles, so that also, that's captured nationally, but the other resources, the mineral, res mineral resources of the deep ocean floor, that's captured by common heritage of the International Seabed Authority. So you do have this area, and you have this, the International Seabed Authority is an embodiment of sorts of communitarianism, right? and whether that communitarianism, as I'm describing, in terms of does that exist for other resources or for new resources? And I'm thinking specifically now for genetic resources. This is a big dispute that you're going to hear if you have not speak too long. Where it's a big conversation that's taking place in terms of the area beyond national jurisdiction and those kinds of discussions as to whether common heritage expands beyond mineral resources to include marine genetic resources. And there hasn't been. There's a good. There's arguments that are raised as to whether that communitarian concept applies to not just mineral resources, but all other types, other than fishing resources, but other types of resources in the ocean. And then there's the out counter argument that says, no, the common heritage is very specific in the convention. And that's all we have in the convention. And it only applies to mineral resources. And it does not, therefore, <coughs> automatically apply to marine genetic resources. And that conversation goes, is, is continuing in one point or another. We have fisheries, of course, in the high seas. The other day, and, uh, Thomas Heider, Judge Heider, talked about the fishing resources in the 200 nautical mile zone in the central Arctic Ocean. Uh, that is an area where um, there, is, uh, there is regulation, but there's not regulation of an RFNO, 
Regional Fisheries Management Organization, and that is an area where conceptually, if not realistically, because there's no fish yet, you know, that, that is a, that that's an area of high seas, but there may not be, a high, even in the high seas, there may not be a high seas fishing right. I'll come back to that momentarily. What I want to talk about a little bit is, in the 1982, is freedom of navigation. Because freedom of navigation is a high seas right, which is fair enough. Freedom to go where you need to go on the high seas. Freedom of your vessel can be under your control, only your control, on the high seas. But the other part here that people, some, you guys wouldn't miss it because you've already been told all this and you've already read it, and many of you know it. Of course, if the high seas freedom of navigation regime actually applies within the 200 nautical mile zone as well. You watch the convention carefully, right? Uh, it, it, you, you know, you have what you have certain rights in your exclusive economic zone, but most of those are mineral reserves. No, no, the most of them are resource rights. Okay. They're not navigational rights. So it, it drives some. It, it bothers some people, and myself included, every once in a while, that if you are going to pick on the Americans for a second, probably not a good day to be picking on Americans. You should probably take up a collection. Get Larry, he's gone now. I'll buy Larry a really big bottle of whiskey or something. Trinidadian, Trinidad, Trinbagonian, Jamaican rum would be good, I think. <laughs> good for him. We'll take, take a little. I'll put some money into that for him. He probably could use some. <laughs> buy him some rum later. But the United States, in their, when, when they talk about the high seas navigation, they, when they talk about international waters, and when you look at U.S. legislation, they refer to international waters. And where international waters starts is from the edge of the territorial sea. Now, many of us find that to be odd, because we think about international waters as being the high seas. And the U.S. is not wrong, maybe misinformed a bit, but what they are suggesting is, and what they mean by the international waters in U.S. legislation is those are the waters where freedom of navigation exists. And it's just important to remember that, and not just when you're dealing with the United States, but when you're dealing with, at least there's an argument to be made, that freedom of navigation, the high seas freedom of navigation, exists beyond 12 nautical miles. And the Russians would agree with that. Almost for sure. Now, there's some disagreement on this. I did say this is an American perspective. I think it's a widely held perspective, but it's not widely held by everybody. For example, there are certain navigational rights that you have for commercial vessels, which is one thing, and then you have certain navigational rights that exist for military vessels. And then the, the argument, I don't want to get into this too much, but can you do military exercises in another state? I'll use the United States because they've got the capacity. Can, can American vessels, can they undertake, legally, can they undertake military activities? I don't mean like attacks, but I mean military, you know, whatever Navy people do when they go on maneuvers and when they should move around and they play guns and stuff. Uh, in another country's 200 nautical miles up. The US perspective would be that's high seas. I can do it in the high seas, I can do it in the 200 nautical miles up. There's some differences of opinion there, and that's not really up to me to, to, to answer those, but to kind of point them out. Other freedom of navigation, high seas freedoms as we know them, uh, have been, you know, innocent passage is not really a high seas freedom, but it's out there. And of course, you have international straits. And you, so you have vestiges of freedom of navigation from a high seas perspective that continue to exist. And this was a key part of the bargain that was struck, because what the United States and Russia and other countries wanted was the protection of certain navigational freedoms and what they yielded in a way, it was a trade-off a little bit, was common heritage concerns, 200 nautical mile concerns, and was resource concerns. When you look at the grand deal of the Law of the Sea Convention, that's what it was. Navigational rights, resource rights. I won't go back into how the United States handled some of the negotiations. The United States, to their credit, put on the table in 1972-73, a, 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 a proposal, the Kissinger proposal, the Kissinger proposals that would have actually provided real money to the developing world. 
because the United States would sell sense say continental shelf only goes this far. Anything beyond that is not so much common heritage, but then nevertheless, there'll be more resources available for you, and we'll cut it at 50, at the, it was it 50 nautical miles? Yeah, 50 nautical miles. So, so you had an American proposal which was more generous than and, and came before the 200 nautical mile zone, but was, would have been more generous to almost all of the developing countries in terms of continental shelf resources and everything else. But all of us, and I include Canada here, all of us didn't like this. What we wanted was our own 200 nautical mile zone. And what the United States was sort of saying was 50 nautical miles, but we're going to share. I mean, not just the U.S., but we'll share everything else out there with real money. It was a Kissinger proposal. It was one of the last that I'm aware of, of what I would call the grand gestures of the United States. This was a gesture to try and get navigational rights, but also to be, um, provide real financial support, in a way, to developing countries. And it got rejected. And it rejected for a number of good reasons. But I won't go into that in that too much. But it does talk a little bit about the high seas freedoms in some a big way. The other high seas issue I want to talk about now is marine scientific research, since that is back. Um, marine scientific research is, you know, I don't know how you describe it, but it really can be serious marine scientific research arose in the 1940s, 1950s, coming out of the Second World War, largely. And you had a, a, you know, an increasing, again, mostly of the developed states with the capacity to do marine scientific research, led by the United States, led by Russia who've always had significant marine scientific research, particularly in the Arctic, but elsewhere as well, capacities. And part of that, not talked about in the 1958 convention, was the idea that marine scientific research was a humanitarian value. It was something good for the community. It was good that we understood the salinity of the seawater. It was good that we understood how currents work. It's good that we understand water temperatures. We understand all of this. This is a community value that the science people are bringing to us. And not surprisingly, with that sort of an understanding, it has always been seen, or it became seen in the Law of the Sea Convention. It was never mentioned before that. We came in the Law of the Sea Convention to be part of high sea rights, with the right to undertake marine scientific research. The wrinkle that developed here a little bit was the 200 nautical mile zone. And the wrinkle that developed here, when you go back and you look at some of the, the, the concerns that were expressed, is well, marine scientific research is a good thing. I had no problem with that in terms of the high seas, it's a positive thing. But there was always some concern, leveled mostly or perceived as mostly at the United States, but yeah, a little tiny bit at the Russians too. They weren't unique on this one. They kind of got together again. Uh, are they doing marine scientific research? Or are they doing intelligence gathering? In other words, you've got to look like a spy. They are spies, right? Were they spying on us when they're out there? And, and that was a real, real concern at the time. And if you look back, I've you know, read Fred's book. He doesn't say it this way, but he would if he was being a little more direct. Fred, Dr. Singh wrote the major book on marine scientific research. He doesn't word it this way, but he knows it to be true that one of the reasons why marine scientific research got put into the 200 nautical mile zone was largely this concern, two concerns. One is somebody's marine scientific research is somebody's spying, and of course somebody's marine scientific research is researching my resources, given that you now have my resources in terms of fisheries and in terms of the continental shelf. So we ended up with what is a communitarian value which is marine scientific research generically, is a high seas right. And if you're beyond, if you're in the high seas, the geographic high seas, then yes, that applies. But if you're in somebody's 200 nautical mile zone, then there's a consent-based, I won't get into the detail, but there's a consent-based process where uh, it's supposed to be a default system. In other words, a country or a researcher can ask for consent to do marine scientific research. And if it's not granted, you're supposed to be able to go ahead and do it. Well, if it's not granted, it's not granted. But if, if you don't get any response, you're supposed to be able to do the research. But that's kind of evolved, depending on the, and Larry can explain this a bit better, but evolved in different countries in different ways. And there's some countries that if you don't get a yes answer back, you don't do the research. And 
the legitimate concern of the coastal state, while I've made much of the spying, the legitimate concern, the real concern of the coastal state has always been you can't use marine scientific research as a way to acquire or get engaged with or know more about our resources than we do, is one way to think about it. So marine scientific research is a high seas right. It still exists in the geographic high seas. But it's been shifted a little bit. And I think what's happening to marine scientific research, not my area particularly, although I do watch how countries deal with it, uh, that it's becoming more uh, of a serious consent, but you do have to have the consent to do it. And the countries are becoming ever more nervous, shall we say, about other people doing marine scientific research in their, in their state waters. Now, I'm going to leave out of high seas just because I want to uh, the issues to do with, which are really fascinating, high seas issues, and that's, of course, cables, you know, and uh, whatever goes with cables. Cables. Submarine uh, pipelines, pipelines, cables, those kinds of things, which is sort of a high seas right, and it is a high seas right in a way, but it's a high seas right that actually applies very much in your exclusive economic zone. And you watch all of the zones and stuff that they all kind of exclude the idea of submarine cables and pipelines. This is probably a good thing. All of you people now watching Bisley, have they announced the end of the election yet? No? There's still hope? Uh, yeah. Bill, Bill Clinton was from hope. So I'm going to hope that his wife will let me know. There's still hope. Now, where was I going with that? Was that? They need my vote. Yeah, that was, I can't vote the American election. I can try. Where was I going? The fact that uh, cables and pipelines. Uh, oh, yeah! Cables and pipelines. <laughs> really important. Good positive. You should always use notes. I do, but they're way over there. Uh, cables and pipelines. All of you checking out the American election, almost all that information is going on under the cable. It's not going on the satellite. It's going under the water. People don't know that. It's amazing. It's going under the water. It depends on, probably not this area, but it depends on being able to use put the cables through China's waters and on their seaport, it depends on being able to put that on Canada's waters and the seaport. So it's a, you know, it's not a high seas right, but it's a, sep it's a special right. Now there are some controls you can put on this, but it's really, 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 really important for telecommunications and, you know, moving of other products and to the pipelines. But it, you know, we don't think about it very much. And the international law around this is very strange, which I'm going to put my head down so I don't know the answer to any other question. The other high seas thing I just want to talk about a little bit is marine environmental protection. Okay? And I'm thinking in the 1982 convention, there's really not a lot about environmental protection of the high seas area in any particular way. Now you do have the beginning of certain conventions like the London Dumping Convention and a few other conventions like that where you're starting to get where you can't necessarily use the high seas as a garbage dump. Okay? So you get some you get some treaties like that that are starting to see the high seas area and the protect and specific obligations um, to, to deal with you know, that protecting of that area. The other thing you have of course is shipping and shipping uh, the idea is for safe ships don't leak which is good but operational pollution takes place and it can take place on the high seas. You can have operational pollution in other words you've got to clean your valves and tanks and stuff like that you can do that on the high seas. Marpole and Solas have made the ships a lot cleaner, safer, and all that sort of stuff. So you, you, you do have kind of an inherent uh, part of marine environmental protection right now. So what's next? Where do, we, where do we go after the convention? Where do we go now into the 21st century on these high seas fishing rights? High seas rights. Well, with fishing, right, you probably, I know you've heard it because I listened to, to, to Judge Heider talk about it the other day. High seas fishing is probably gone as a right. Now, there's some arguments here. A good lawyer, I will argue this. What I think after the 1958, some 1995, the United Nations Fish Stocks Agreement, all of the regional fisheries management organizations that are out there, what we're seeing is, if not the end of the idea 
of there being a right to fish on the high seas. If it's not gone yet, it's close to gone. Right? If you're signed up to the fish stocks agreements, you've not exactly given up your rights to fish in the high seas, but you've at least limited them. Now, I watched the way Judge Hyder responded to whether something or other was customary in international law, and I'm not a big customary in international law guy most of the time. But I think there's good, at least some argument to be made that that idea of being able to stick your boat out there and go and fish beyond 200 nautical miles uh, is close to extinguished <coughs> as a high seas right. If it's not totally there, it's going to be gone soon. Now, we do have certain resources that are not caught by RFMOs, but I think we're getting into that. That's going to be the first of the high seas rights that I've talked about that in the 21st century is essentially going to be gone. Now, as a lawyer, I can continue to craft the argument that I'm not a party. I'm part of a lot of the sea convention, but I'm not a party to the unfund. I'm not a party to an RFMO that my fishing vessel can still fish in an RFMO area. Or it can still fish in areas that are not covered by RFMOs. But that's a tough legal argument these days. And I think we're slowly moving down, but not too far away from the elimination, if not the outcome, of high seas fishing needs. I don't cry any tears to that. I'm not, I mean, as a lawyer, I, would be just, I can understand why I would argue for the legal reality of the fishing right, but I'm not too fussed about it in the grand scheme of things. It seems to be odd that you could, <coughs> have a resource that desperately needs to be managed, and yet you can continue to have with that a high seas fishing right, which basically says you can go get what you want. So that the two things don't meet very well in one point. So I think we're seeing that time honor, if you want to put it that way, long time high seas fishing right, high seas right, that we're seeing kind of the end of that. Navigation. Freedom of navigation, freedom of shipping. I think we're starting to see some movements around that a little bit. In two, two or three different parts, I think. Um, it's under pressure, I would say. Piracy has brought freedom of the high seas under pressure. Piracy has always been a problem, but our expanded, our minimal definition, our limited definition of piracy is has expanded. Concerns in the, in the last 15 years uh, about uh, uh, terrorism has led to increasing treaties and the rights to engage with vessels on the high seas, regardless of whether they're your flag or not. Now, we haven't gone down to where you have an absolute right just because you think it's a vessel you don't like to board that vessel, but we are seeing treaties now that do give that opportunity to states, whether for drug suppression or whether for, um, uh, for um, <coughs> terrorism uh, purposes and rogue state vessels. So we still have a freedom of navigation, a freedom of the vessel on the high seas to respect the flag, but you're starting to see a lot more reasons and possibilities as to why you can interfere with that right of one type of another. We also, of course, have increased global standards for vessels on the high seas, which is Marple and Celeste, and I won't talk about that uh, too much. We're starting to see um, more areas that might be special areas of one type or another under the International Maritime and Marple's things. We're starting to see PSSAs that are starting to move a little tiny bit, if not within 200 nautical miles. And what these are, at least the way I'm putting them a little bit, are more about the movement issue of vessels. Vessels that move, na the national navigation of the vessel, rather than the vessel itself. And you're starting to see some movement uh, in terms of the law and in terms of what's, ex what's acceptable in terms of vessels on the high seas and their navigational rights, um, even on the high seas in one form or another. Where there's an increased pressure in this area, and when you, this is where I, I, I think navigational freedoms are going to start to split. Now, I'm talking about the future, not today, but I think we're starting to... There's a big difference between a commercial vessel 
and a military vessel or a sovereign vessel. I've never quite understood why a commercial vessel necessarily has the right to go to an innocent passage route. I mean, I understand why it's important commercially, but I mean, I, I've got that old little, sorry, there's an old little Canadian thing, well, it used to be back here, but I got, it's up here now, kind of falling off. But, little Canadian thing, let me get this straight. I got an oil tanker that's spilling oil all over the place. It's got a right of innocent passage in my waters? That doesn't sound right. I mean, I maybe want to bring it in to fix it. Right. That's okay, but I'd like it. The commercial rights of innocent passage and all those things, it's always, you know, it's, just, it's always looked weird. And they've all piggybacked. The commercial rights people, I love them, you ship owners. The minute you bring up a navigational issue, they, 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 you know, they, they're not happy. They don't want to have navigational constraints because it's bad for business. The problem we have in the Law of the Sea Convention, or at least the observation in the Law of the Sea Convention, is that we basically have navigational rights that matter mostly for military vessels. Now, I take the point that you want to have freedom of navigation for a military vessel. I mean, I don't like it for a whole lot. As far as I'm concerned, I think all Navy vessels should just stay at home. What? Everyone would be happier. The families would be happier because all the sailors would all be at home all the time. I'm so happy, I suppose. Uh, but, you know, but that's okay. That wouldn't bother me. I'm not a big military person. I grew up in a military town. I'm not a big military person. Yeah, I'm a big fan of big military. I mean, Canada should have a huge military. Just don't give them anything to play with. Okay? No guns, <laughs> no boats. They might hurt themselves. It's good to have a big military, but maybe not give them any equipment. That's sort of what Canada does. It kind of works that way. You don't give them guns. They hurt themselves. It's terrible. <laughs> And our ships, we love our navy ships, they tend to run into things. Each other, occasionally. <laughs> Halifax Harbor, great big island in the middle of the harbor, spot, right in the middle of it. How they do that, I still don't understand. True story, almost a true story. Uh, not quite true, close to true. It actually has some tiny element of truth in that story. Okay. But you can understand freedom of navigation being pursued in a military sense. But freedom of navigation in a commercial sense is always sort of, why? But in the Law of the Sea Convention, for a variety of reasons, the two have always been brought together. And I think that's one of the things that I think we're going to see some differences in as we move forward in the 21st century. No one wants to mess with sovereign investments. I understand that. I've written about this. I understand it. I understand governments. Uh, you're going to need that in one form or another. At the same time, countries are concerned about sovereign investments. You know, in this part of the world, there are a number of countries that don't like the idea of innocent passage rights for military vessels. At least not without, yeah, they don't mind it. They're not, I don't know, we're not against it. But we just want you to let us know you're coming. Right? We need permission or we need notice and there's all, and that's a dispute that's gone on and I'm not going to resolve that today, but that's an issue that's gone on before. But if you think about it for a second, the idea of freedom of navigation for commercial vessels, while well, it makes sense commercially, doesn't necessarily make sense in terms of high seas rights. And we may see some movement in that in the 21st century. I don't know. I think it's possible in one way or another. Marine scientific research, I think that's going to get a bit more restricted in one form or another. Now, what I'm going to end with, I am going to end, and it took much longer than I thought I was going to take, and I apologize for that, but I just don't want to hear the end of it. I don't want to hear the election results. <laughs> Okay, I'm just too depressed already. If I find out that it's real, I'm probably just going to go home and cry. <laughs> but those of you, the next talk is going to be, I think, going to be on AVNJ. Yeah? Okay. Think about what AVNJ, Area Beyond National Jurisdiction, what are they talking about in New York? Well, they talk about lots of fun things. They talk about marine protected areas beyond national they talk about area-based management tools on national jurisdiction. <laughs> I, I say interference, I don't mean it as a negative. But what's this going to do to freedom of the high seas? And keep in mind, I don't see this as a negative. Okay? I'm just pointing out that we're seeing some in, I want to say intrusion, just because that's the only word I can think of. We're starting to see, again, that freedom of the high seas is such a bottom, such a 
a main principle that may get changed. I don't have a problem with it. Okay, I'm not suggesting this is a negative. I'm just accepting because it's the title of my talk. 21st century, freedom of the high seas. We're going to see change. We're going to see it in the AVNJ world. The trick in the AVNJ world, not to put, put questions in your mind. These are the questions. Who, who's speaking then? Good. Uh, good. Uh, I don't see her here, so it's perfect. Uh, questions to ask. Who gets to decide where an MPA goes? Can Argentina, can Argentina, Chile, Bolivia, Korea, yeah, what the hell, Korea, can the four of them get together and create an MPA in the Arctic Ocean? Yeah, I know, but that's a question. How do you sort that out? How do you sort that out? Who gets to make those decisions as to where an MPA is? And then who gets to make those decisions? And I don't know the answer, and I do know, because I've been at the first session of the PBNJ, so I know the problems. But the other part of it is, you know, and then what do they decide what measures can be taken? And, and that's no problem. That you can, but again, how does that interfere with And again, I say interfere is not in a negative sense, but how is that going to jive? That's a word for jive. English, you know, how's it going to snuggle up to? That's even better. How's it going to snuggle up to the concept of freedom of high seas navigation? Get out of your face now. Always <laughs> oh, <it's> embarrassing. Sorry. <laughs> she has such a nice smile. I'm going to do this again tomorrow. Um, and just to leave it, because I'm tired. It's an hour. I went longer than I thought. I actually did look at my notes twice. So that's pretty impressive. What do you do with an unmanned ship, a drone ship? Do they have a high seas fishing right? No. Do they have a high seas navigational right? Nobody on board. I don't know. Uh, Stuart Kay, a colleague of, uh, of, of Clive, he has a whole lot of these in his bathtub. He plays with them. But he gave a brilliant presentation in New York uh, a couple of months ago about what's going on in the world of, I'm going to call them drone ships, right? or you know, uh, vessels that are un, un, unmanned, uncrewed. Autonomous vessels. What's that? Autonomous vessels. Autonomous vessels. Autonomous vessels. That's too hard to spell. But autonomous vessels. Now, we have some in science. You have gliders and stuff like that. But we're talking about much larger vessels that are, might be in inspection vessels. We're not talking about the MSR vessels either that may have other purposes. And what do you, what's that going to do, or what might that do, in the high seas world? Thanks very much, everyone. I'll see you tomorrow morning. No questions. It's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's right.